Hello, it's Rick Jones, Captain of Fishbait Marketing, coming to you today from the bridge. Your place for all things about corporate sponsorship and event marketing. We've got another great show lined up for you today. We're continuing our discussion about sponsorship fit. And we have Colleen Troy as today's guest angler, speaking on how to effectively use public relations as a sponsorship tool. Plus, we'll have another segment of On the Road with Rick. So let's jump right in from the bridge. Last episode, we started a discussion about what makes the right fit for both properties and brands, and of course for fans in their respective partnerships. It all begins with the right audience fit. Does the property reach the right fans? Does the brand also resonate with those fans? And can they bring meaningful value to those fans? Not, is it a good fit, but rather, is it the perfect fit? We discussed understanding the demographic and psychographic makeup of the audience. Today, let's go a little deeper in understanding the five different and unique age groups in today's marketplace. The oldest group in the marketplace are what we call the matures, and these are folks that are now 74 years of age or older. Here are some defining characteristics of this group. Their defining idea is the concept of duty. They came of age during the Second World War and went into the workforce in the 1950s, and they reflect the values of those days. Their tagline is, we earned it. Uh, this is the generation that Tom Brokaw often refers to as the greatest generation. Uh, their media was largely the radio, uh, and therefore they listened better than a lot of different generations because they grew up listening. Um, their television was uh, uh, about Peyton Place. That was the soap opera of the era. Their music was Sinatra. And they were very influenced by celebrity endorsement. Um, it was interesting when Viagra first came out, Viagra used Bob Dole uh, as a spokesperson. And that wasn't a surprise because people trusted spokespeople of their age group. Uh, this was the generation where Joe Namath, the famous quarterback for Alabama and the New York Jets, he took it off with Noxzema shaving cream in a unique campaign. And this was also the era of what we call the Miller Lite All-Stars. Uh, a lot of people, uh, for younger people, you, you may not remember that we didn't always have light beer. Uh, light beer came of age in the 1960s, and the perception was that it was going to be sissy beer or weenie beer as light beer. And the way they combat, uh, um, combated that was they got a group of ex-jocks uh, to do a series of commercials uh, making l- light beer cool uh, and making it respectable for people to uh, to drink it. Uh, this generation today, their, their large concerns are health care, uh, running out of retirement income, um, extended multi-generational families, uh, and their value today as, a, as an individual. If you're over 74 years of age, do you still have value? Uh, in the marketplace. What kind of opportunities are there for marketers today with this generation? Well, clearly utilization. They still want to be used. They still want to be valued. Nostalgia is very, very important to them. And you hear music of their era as a way of reaching them. Clearly health-related products and services or opportunities. Extended family activities and extended family activities like travel or ways to be able to do things with this generation. But sadly, their market position today is that very few brands are after this audience. They feel that they're already predisposed to brand selection. They're aging rapidly, but they're still a great audience for traditional food brands. Um, As an aside, I really believe that uh, traditional food brands are in a lot of trouble uh, right now. Um, The Crafts, the Campbells, the Heinz, uh, the Oscar Myers, uh, they're getting squeezed a couple of places. They're uh, being charged more and more to slot their products on grocery shelves uh, by the leading retailers like the Walmarts and the Kroger's. Um, and at the same time, Kroger's saying, hey, we're going to put your 
product on the shelf, but right next to it, we're going to have our private label brand for about a dollar cheaper than your brand, so they're being pushed. And yet I feel like an older audience is a great place for these brands to continue to sell products to. The second generation group is my group. I'm a baby boomer. Uh, We're between the ages of 55 and 73, and we are still a very large population group. We also control the vast majority of the disposable income in America today. So it's still a very, very important group for marketers. Our defining idea really was individuality. Uh, We grew up in the 60s in that turbulent era in our history. We had the idea that we were going to change the world. If the previous generation said we earned it, our generation said we deserve it. Uh, Our media was really the first television generation. We grew up on Howdy Doody and Sky King and TV Westerns and a whole lot of other things like that. Uh, Our soap opera of the day was a show called Dallas uh, with a character called J.R. Um, Largely the music of the Beatles. Uh, Baby boomers are influenced by information. We still believe that things are black and white, and if we can get enough information, we can make the proper decision about that. Um, What are the concerns of baby boomers? Well, debt is still a concern. This generation ran up a significant amount of credit card debt and are still paying for it. Uh, Retirement income, do we have enough? You know, we often uh, talk about social issues and financial things when we're talking about things like Social Security, Um, Social Security works really well when you collect it at 65 and die at 66. The math doesn't quite work when you start collecting it at 65 and you live to be 95. And that's part of the issue that we have. And so I think our generation is really wondering, oh, we're going to run out of income as we uh, grow older but not up. Um, We're also kind of the the baloney in the sandwich. Many of us still have parents that are alive. And so parental care is very important. And at the same time, we're concerned about our children's jobs and their future. We're also very, very concerned about grandchildren and their future. Um, And we've been in the rat race for a long, long time and uh, would like to kind of get out of the rat race, but don't know how to do that. Um, What kind of opportunities are there? Well, clearly extended family experiences are part of that. Nostalgia, again, uh, there was a reason that Cadillac a few years ago ran uh, an ad campaign using the music of Led Zeppelin. Uh, They want to sell to older people. They want to make sure that we don't think we're old. Um, Health and wellness is also uh, a a big, big concern. Um, You know, I quoted earlier the Jimmy Buffett line, I'm growing older but not up. Um, We we think we're going to live forever, and we want to remain healthy and vibrant and all that. I think protecting wealth and protecting our lifestyle is very, very important to, uh, to, to baby boomers. And do we still matter? I- I'm seeing so many of my contemporaries that have lost jobs late in their 50s, and they're struggling uh, to find that. And they're hearing that, that classic comment, uh, hey, you're overqualified. Now, I-, I run a series of businesses And I got to be honest with you, I love hiring overqualified people. Uh, Those are very, very smart, wise people. But we're finding in the marketplace that a lot of baby boomers are being aged out. um, And that's kind of sad. From a market position, uh, baby boomers are becoming more like matures. Um, uh, But we still hold much of the wealth and disposable income in America. And I think people need to, to realize that. But most marketers think that baby boomers are dead. Uh, A few years ago, AARP ran a really interesting ad campaign. They had an older couple holding hands uh, side by side, and then you realize they were both laying on a gurney, and they both had their toes tagged as if they were dead. (laughs) And the image was that uh, baby boomers no longer mattered in the marketplace, and yet we're still alive and we're still doing things. Um. You know, the truth is Elvis has not left the building for baby boomers. Um, We're still around. Uh, We're still a force to be reckoned with. Um, The next group is the smallest from a population-wise standpoint, and this is called Generation X. And they were named Generation X because there was a a book written about that generation back in the uh, early 1980s that labeled them as Generation X. Um, Their defining idea really has been diversity. 
Uh, and their tagline is not they earned it or they deserve it, but they need it. In many ways, this generation um, was raised in dysfunction. Um, they're the first generation that mom and dad both worked. And so they were largely latchkey kids. Uh, there was high rate of divorce among their parents. It was the era of gas shortages and all sorts of concerns in the economy. And so they grew up with that kind of stress points. This was the first generation of cable television. Uh, they grew up on cable TV. Uh, their shows were shows like Melrose Place and Friends. You know, when you really dial it up, uh, Friends was really a story of the family you choose. Um, in, in, in a case that maybe your real family was very dysfunctional, you uh, were able to pick your own family, and that's what Friends was really all about. Uh, this was the music uh, of their generation was R.E.M. and other artists like that. This generation was very much influenced by their peer group. Uh, they wanted to hear what others in their age group uh, felt about things and recommended. This generation really sought balance early. They looked at my generation, the baby boomers, and said the only thing in the rat race are rats. Um, they saw a lack of loyalty in the workplace. They also began to realize that, they, that Social Security may not be around, that they may run out of money uh, at some point. Uh, this is a generation that now has kids largely in college or leaving college. Um, and this is a generation that has a significant number of aging parents. Um, it's really interesting that this generation is the generation of parents that have now tried to pay their way for their kids to get in colleges. The recent scandal of the pay to get in Southern Cal and Stanford and Yale and other places was largely Gen Xers that, that drove this, uh, wanting their children to have a prestigious uh, education. Uh, what kind of opportunities are there for this generation? Well, clearly peer group activities continue to be that. They're also coming into a significant amount of wealth. They're both inheriting wealth from their parents as they're passing away, but also as their kids get out of college, they're getting a pay raise. Um, their market position is that while they're the smallest in numbers and population, and they're being squeezed by two very powerful generations, the baby boomers on one hand and the millennials on the other hand, uh, many in this age group now are in positions of both power and influence. And so this is a generation you can't discount. The fourth group, um, age group in our population today are the millennials. And this is the largest group in our population, and their age is 24 to 42. Their defining idea has been connectivity, and their tagline has been, we will change it. Um, this is the first internet generation. Uh, their TV soap opera was a thing called Dawson's Creek. Their music was people like uh, Katy Perry and Beyonce and Lady Gaga, um, clearly influenced by the internet and that total amount of connectivity. Uh, what are this generation's concerns? The environment is one. Uh, they're seeing the deterioration uh, of our infrastructure and our environmental um, problems, and they're very concerned about that. They're also concerned about jobs. Um, they feel that they may be the first generation that got out of college and went into the workforce and took a pay cut, and that they're not catching up, and they may not have the lifestyle that their parents had. Uh, this is a very politically active generation. Uh, this is a generation that is very much in favor of, of equality uh, across um, uh, all aspects of our society. And it's a generation that clearly wants balance. Uh, jobs are not as important. Uh, life is more important uh, maybe than jobs are. What kind of opportunities are there with millennials? Well, clearly they want to participate. They want to be part of movements. They're not part of institutions. We're seeing, um, you know, we're really seeing a, a decline in institutions uh, across America, a decline in uh, memberships in churches, a decline in uh, memberships in things like Rotary or Kiwanis clubs or other civic organizations. And it's largely because this group doesn't want to be part of an institution. They want to be part of movements. And so they, they want to do things. They want to participate. Uh, social occasions are very, very important to this group. Very much new twist on traditional sports. We're seeing that 
this generation doesn't want to sit in seats in stadiums and arenas. They want to be able to visit with friends and surf around and drink craft beers and uh, eat great appetizers and visit with one friend and then maybe go watch a little of the game and come back and visit with another friend. Uh, Clearly, digital and mobile applications for everything are important to this group. And this group is largely having children now, and so children's activities uh, are becoming more and more important to this segment. Uh, We did some, some studies about why this group was not attending college football games. And one of the things we found that is in a displaced society, you know, in a, in, in a previous era, you know, grandmother lived in the same town <laughs> as you did. Well, grandmother's now retired to the beach in Florida someplace, and you know, you, you're stuck in uh, Lexington, Kentucky, and you're not going to Kentucky football games. And we had to go a little deeper and find the reason. Well, one of the reasons is you have a four-year-old and a two-year-old. And who's going to take care of the kids if you go to a game? And so one of the things that we're recommending to a number of our clients now is game day daycare, where you've got to be able to provide uh, those services for this particular group in order to serve their children's needs. The market position is the biggest. Uh, this is the biggest target still for brands. It's the largest population, uh, tremendous uh, economic impact, and is the largest uh, target for brands. And the fifth and final group, generationally, is what we call Gen Z or Zebras. And these are the under 20, uh, age 24 age group. Um, Their defining idea clearly is education. This is the most highly educated uh, of of any group we've ever had in American society. Uh, They live in a truly global economy. Uh, They realize there are no borders. Um, and that they're going to conduct business on a worldwide basis and kind of live their lives on a worldwide basis. Uh, this is the, the generation of handheld devices and total connectivity 24-7. Uh, their smartphone is the most important uh, piece of equipment they have in their lives. They have to constantly stay connected. Television has become largely irrelevant, um, This is the content-on-demand generation across multiple platforms. It's also what we call the YouTube generation, where they're posting lots and lots of content, and they're gaining um, uh, lots and lots of information through through their handheld devices. Um, You know, this is the generation of Justin Bieber and the Wiggles and uh, and lots of interesting uh, musical influences. Uh, They're still influenced uh, largely by controlling parents. Um... We used to call parents helicopter parents. We're now referring to them as um, lawnmower parents. Uh, they're not helicoptering. They're, they're just running over people. Um, and in many cases, they're doing their children a disservice because they're not letting them do things on their own, um, strongly enabling this group. Uh, this is also a group with significant information overload. Um, when you have all the information in the world at your fingertips, how do you process that? And how do you take away what's important uh, for your life? I read an article in the Wall Street Journal recently that really alarmed me that said of this generation, 46% of this generation is suffering from anxiety. Um, And so uh, clearly we've got an issue uh, with this generation that they're overly anxious and I think part of it is when you live in a social media world, it appears that everybody's life is better than yours. Everybody's job's better. Everybody's relationships are better. Everybody's a better athlete. Everybody's a better dresser. Well, here's the truth. You know, on social media, I've, I've never seen anybody post, you know, hey, this weekend sucked. Uh, you know, they don't do that. They talk about all the great things in their lives, whether they were great or not. And so uh, everybody feels like they have to keep up with the Joneses and they have to live their lives with those kinds of uh, influence and expectations that I think are a little bit out of control. Um, Now, this generation has some concerns that no other generation had, and safety being the first one. This is the generation that has grown up never knowing that people don't come into schools and shoot people. This is part of their reality. This, their entire lives we've had, um, from Columbine on, we've had shootings. Um, and so that's their norm. 
They're also very concerned about the cost of education and, more importantly, the effectiveness of the educations that they're getting. Are they getting meaningful um, things that are going to help their um, their livelihoods? Um, and competitiveness, not only competitiveness within their own peer group, but are baby boomers going to retire? <laughs> are extras going to retire? Are there going to be any jobs for this generation? Are they going to be able to move up like other previous generations did? Um, and then the competitiveness is not only the competitiveness of, of other Americans, but, but globally. Are their jobs going to be taken by somebody in India uh, or uh, Brazil or, or someplace else? Big opportunities with this generation. Education continues to be one. Equality continues to be one. And change I think this generation in many ways is, are going to be change uh, agents. They're looking at things that are not happening, that our generation and other generations above them are not solving, what problems they're not addressing. And I believe you're going to see them be very, very politically active going forward. I did read an, a different article the other day that also said, though, they're, they're not responding to cause marketing. They don't feel that they need to give to causes like other generations do. And that's going to be interesting as we see if that continues to be a trend, especially if they can't get a tax deduction. Um, Are they going to want to donate to churches and uh, social causes and the medical causes and those kinds of things going forward? Um, But they have a huge market position. They have huge purchasing and social influence right now, and it's growing every day. And so we've um, we've got five different generations in the marketplace. And so you know, one of the key takeaways today is about fit is no one size fits all. Years and years ago, I worked for Sears uh, in event marketing, and Sears's position was they were the store for everybody. Well, what happened was they became not only all things to no people, they became no things to all people. And those are both really, really bad. Um, but we're only skimming the surface of what you need to know about each of these five generations out there. Plus, there are dozens of subsets of each of these generations. But at least for today, here's today's Tuesday tip. Everyone knows that all efforts begin with a dream. Dreams lead to goals. And I like to define goals as dreams with deadlines. Deadlines require starts. What have you been dreaming about that you have not yet started? And what are you waiting for? The longest journey always begins with a single step, and then another step, and another, and another. When are you getting started? Our guest angler today is my dear friend, Colleen Troy, owner and president of Touchpoint Communications, one of South Carolina's premier public relations and marketing communications firms. Colleen, welcome to From the Bridge. Thanks, Rick. Thanks for asking me. Now, you're a Midwestern girl. Mm. Tell me a little bit about your background, uh, how you got to Charleston, and then tell us a little bit about Touchpoint. Sure. So I am a Midwestern girl. I grew up in Lapeer, Michigan, the land of hunting, fishing, and farming. And um, I still do all of those things. I just do it as a career. Um, So, yeah, so I was a, um, you know, good student in high school, went off to college, decided to go to the big city of New York, worked at NYU for a number of years in the public relations field, loved it, moved to Charleston, started working with an agency, and then decided I could probably just do that by myself and started my own firm about 14 years ago. Um, And so it started as journalism and now it's a whole bunch of other communications exercises. Yeah, it's all kind of run together today, I think. You know, I, I, I often tell people, you know, the consumer doesn't live in verticals. <laughs> they live in horizontals. They don't understand the difference between marketing, advertising, PR, or any other form of communication. You're right. I, when I worked for an advertising agency and I ran the PR department, I would have an idea that I wasn't allowed to have because I wasn't a creative. And that just seemed stupid to me. Like, we're all creative. Why can't I have an idea that you would execute? And we don't do that at my company. Where touch point means you figure out how to touch that audience and, and then go do it. So. Well, you've done a lot of work in the tourism sector. You've worked with the South Carolina uh, Department of uh, Parks, Recreation, and Tourism, and you've worked with a lot of others in the space. Tell me about that and that kind of niche. 
Well, you know, tourism, we look at tourism as a form of economic development. We don't think of it necessarily as just this, oh, I'm going to go out and take a bunch of braggies on my trip to wherever. We think that um, tourism can be transformative for local economies, just as it can be transformative to an individual's life. And so we get excited about helping organizations figure out how to reach that audience and deliver that product that they want consistently. And we've done that for little farm towns in the PD of South Carolina, and we've done that for the state of South Carolina. We do it for restaurants. We do it for hotels. Um, And it's all just figuring it out. You know, what do you have that's unique and powerful that somebody's going to want? And it might be fishing, and it could be, um, you know, flying airplanes. It's, it's, It's whatever you do. Do it more of it. Well, I know you've been involved in um, a project, I think it's in Lake City, Mm -hmm. uh, with the art project there. Talk talk about that. I mean, that's in the middle of kind of nowhere, but it's become a very, very strong economic uh, development uh, tool for that region. It has. So um, Art Fields is the the 10-day art festival that you're referring to, and... um, it's about seven years running now. It, you know, it's, it speaks to the power of a good booster, and the good booster in this case is Darla Moore, whose hometown is Lake City. It's the PD. Um, used to be a big farming community. It was an agricultural hub, and, you know, you blink, and then it's just like every other southern farm town that's sort of clinging, you know, to the edge um, with 7,000 people and and nowhere for young people to be. So her intention was to invest in her community, create something that didn't exist, and create something that people wanted to come to. Fast forward, Art Fields, you know, seven years in, brings in 20,000 people a spring to Lake City um, through an art competition. And this art competition celebrates Southeastern artists from 12 competing states, um, offers up serious prize money, um, that was the catalyst, but today um, the city's transformed by this investment. And in fact, there are streets lined with gallery spaces, artist studio spaces. Um, there's a new high-end RV park coming in, uh, restaurants, um, you know, lovely boutiques, uh, an amazing hotel. If you walked into this hotel, you would think that you were in Paris or London, and you're in Lake City. I just took a um, group of 12 British journalists there um, who were here celebrating the new British Airlines um, direct service, and they were gobsmacked. Um, They just could not believe that this exists here. And so um, we're really proud of that. You know, that's that notion of economic development and the transformative power that you can have. And it really just starts with an idea. Uh, Yeah, an idea and a willingness to not take no for an answer about the idea. Now, you've worked with a lot of events. In fact, we worked together on Chess Fest Mm -hmm. several years ago. Give us some words of advice about how to use, you know, PR effectively in event marketing and sponsorship. Sure. Well, it's changed a lot since Chess Fest. You know, I think we were really excited at Chess Fest that we had a a MySpace page, which tells you how long ago (laughs) that was. We were really on, we were on fire. But, um, you know, I think that the way you use PR is in a really good, disciplined manner in that you decide up front what your story is and who needs to hear it. And then you just keep telling it and telling it and telling it. And, you know, we find that, there is a cadence. Um, people are not ready to buy tickets until a few weeks before the event, um, but they might be ready to start hearing about your sponsorships or your partnerships or your special programming six months out. We just did a big launch event for the Steeplechase of Charleston um, six months out of the event, and that was really just um, a trick I learned from you, Rick. We we did a big news event and invited a lot of influencers because we were trying to soften the, mu- the market for sponsors so that they understood that this was something big and it was happening and it was going to be exciting. And, you know, we created a visual opportunity. We had lights and sound and music and everything's got to have an Instagram ability to it. But you still have the same basic principles of you better have a good story to tell. Um, And, you know, sometimes all you have is a good story to tell. And that's a fire festival and we don't do those. (laughs) No, no. You know, but I've always really believed that in any event, start big finish big. Nobody will remember what happens in between. I remember we handled MasterCard sponsorship program of the World Cup in, in 94. And we said, we got to get out 
bigger than everybody else because we didn't have the dollars that the Coca-Cola's had or even, I mean, MasterCard didn't have the dollars mm-hmm. that people like Coke had. And, and so one of the things we did was they had the World Cup draw in, um, in Las Vegas, uh, and, and there were like 20 American cities competing to be one of the nine host cities. Well, I went out and bought full-page ads in each of the 20 newspapers that said that we're going to run literally the next day after the draw that said, um, congratulations, Chicago. We always knew you were world-class. Congratulations on being World Cup. And then all I had to do was pull 11. (laughs) I just canceled those the night before. (laughs) Sorry, you're you're not World Cup. But everybody was just amazed because it was such a splash that, God, how did MasterCard, how did they get those ads done? Well, it was just preparation. Um, And I, I like what you said earlier about Human beings love stories. Mm-hmm. And I think people fail in, in many ways with their communications when they don't have a story to tell. Absolutely. And I think that's, you know, I said this all started from a place of being a journalist. I mean, if there isn't a story that I understand and I can hear, I can't tell it. So, um, you know, you can have an event that's fine. And you can spend a whole lot of money to promote a, promote an event. But if you have a good story behind your event, you probably don't have to spend as much money because there's something resonant that people will share with one another and they'll get excited about that. You work with a lot of restaurants in town. So I'm going to ask you an unfair question, but I do a segment uh, each week called On the Road with the Rick where I tell people what I like to eat and where I like to eat it. Tell me one of your favorite places, not your favorite because you can't, Mm-mm. but one of your favorite places and one of your favorite dishes in Charleston. Oh. Like if you were starving and you're probably starving right now, but uh, <laughs> what, 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 what do you crave here in a great food town? Oh, gosh. You're right. I love all of my children equally, <laughs> so I do not have a favorite dish or a favorite restaurant or a favorite place in Charleston. However, I do love that little tavern burger at Big um, Little Jack's. <laughs> in fact, you just said that. My mouth started to yes. water. So yes. yes. I just There's nothing yes. like tucking into a seat at that bar, getting a Coke, eating that burger. Oh, it's just... Amazing. Yes, that's why Jimmy Buffett wrote Cheeseburger in Paradise. <laughs> you know, it's all about that burger. All right, give me your uh, your favorite song and why. Well, that is the hardest question that you're asking me, and I had to think about that. So I, I only, I will tell you that I've already written my funeral playlist, and I've already shared this with my husband, who thinks it's really morbid. But I don't really care. I mean, I'm planning my last party too. <laughs> so I have two, and one is Ants Marching, and one is Beautiful Day. And That's I think great. That they're beautiful. Those are great songs. They're great That's songs. really, really good. Speaking of funerals, uh, Charlotte, my wife, told me the other day that she just wants her tombstone to say simply, Mama tried. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, listen, uh, Colleen, how can people get a hold of you? Well, um, I'm, I'm easily found on uh, the web, although there are numerous companies called Touchpoint, it turns out, many of whom don't pay their bills because I get their calls all the time. But I pay my bills, so I know those calls aren't for me. But we're at touchptcom.com um, and we're all over Twitter and Insta and LinkedIn and it's, it's easy to find us. Colleen Troy at Touchpoint Communications. Well, Colleen, thanks for me and for stopping by today. That's Colleen Troy of Touchpoint Communications segment On the Road with Rick. I'm recently back from a trip to one of my favorites, if not my very favorite food towns, New Orleans. We went to the 50th anniversary of the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Festival, and one of the fun things to do there, besides listening to unbelievable music, is eating great food at one of the over 60-plus food booths at the fairgrounds. Foods like gumbo, beignets, poor boys, you name it. But after kind of grazing all day, for dinner, I'm looking to go to one of those classic New Orleans restaurants. And one of my favorites is the Upper Line. That's Joanne Clevenger's restaurant. My dear friend Jessica Harris introduced me to the Upper Line several years ago, and I've done the same to so many others. Jessica is one of the great American institutions. She is a leading authority on African-American cuisine. She's written a number of historical books about food and the African-American experience, along with numerous um, cookbooks. And so Jessica took me to the Upper Line. At the Upper Line, they claimed that they invented the fried green tomato there. 
and it's really, really good with shrimp romalade sauce. Their fresh fish dishes are amazing, along with some unbelievable desserts like their honey pecan bread pudding. It's located at the end of the famous St. Charles streetcar line in an old home. The upper line, it's simply perfect. Perfect. 